This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. Use the code Linux and save. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 25, Episode 4. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Welcome back to the big show. Guess what? We're finally getting to review Bodhi Linux this week. It's been coming. We've been teasing it for a while, but we had to keep pushing it back. But the delay actually works out pretty well because Enlightenment 17 came out. The final stable bits got pushed into Bodhi Linux, and they have cut off a final release, the version 2.20, I think it is. And uh, the interesting thing about Bodhi Linux is Enlightenment, because it it's kind of has its own heritage, it's been going on for years and years and years now, it's taken its own track. And they have come up with their own solutions and their own ways to solve problems that are done differently than any other desktop environment out there because it's its own beast, it's its own breed. And they bring those solutions in there, and then a distribution like Bodhi wraps it up in a really nice package. So we're going to talk about that today in the second segment of the show. Before that, we've got the news, and then in this segment, it's our picks. And in the news segment, we'll be reviewing Fedora 18, our meta review. We're going to pull together different reviews online, give you some resources to get the most out of Fedora 18 if you already have it installed. And then at the end of the show, it's your emails. Pretty big show. Pretty big show, right? Big show. Huge. Uh, all right, Matt, why don't we start with the Runs Linux this week? What do you say? Let's rock it. Now, unfortunately, uh, this isn't something you and I can get our hands on just yet, but maybe the folks over in Italy will get their hands on it pretty soon. It's called the Kite Tablet, and uh, K-I-T-E Tablet. It runs Ubuntu 12.04 or Android 4.0, so it runs Linux. Mm. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting about it is it actually has a pretty serious screen on there, a 10.1-inch IPS capacitive multi-touch display with 1920 by 1200 resolution, 60 million colors, and it only weighs in at 539 grams, which is about 19 ounces. It has uh, USB. It supports USB keyboards and mice. And uh, you can hook wow. it up and actually use it uh, on a stand and get the full Ubuntu desktop on this tablet. And then you can take it away and use it in some sort of touch capacity, I guess. Back up a second. You caught my interest with something I really liked when you said it. You said that I can USB a keyboard and a mouse to this. Yes, sir. I like that. Yeah. Oh, now yeah. see, now we're now we're talking my language. You know, this old this old guy that needs his keyboard and mouse. And that's and maybe cool. maybe this usage huh. scenario would be when you when you're walking around in touch mode, you're probably mm-hmm. a little more Android heavy, and then when you sure. sit. It seems a little clunky to me, to be honest with you. Well, I like, I mean, I'm not saying this would be the ideal hardware, but the principles, kind of the Asus Transformer experience, you know, I I think it's kind of neat. It'd be interesting to see what the reception is over time. It's uh, going to have uh, two gigs of RAM, too, and uh, you could go up to 32 gigabytes of storage. It'll also have a rear and front-facing camera, GPS. Uh, You know, this looks pretty nice. I got to tell you, though, uh, 1204, solid release, but not... Not for a touch operating system. Not for Not a touch so device. Much, yeah. I mean, yeah, I would agree. It, it does need all, unless they're actually, uh, you know, getting those updates from 1210 in there somehow, which I don't think they probably are. You know, so unless they're doing something really unique. Yeah, maybe so. they're backporting something. It could know. be. Yeah, maybe, maybe from, uh, you know, backports or something. So, uh, Matt, we are somehow managing to broadcast this week. We are live. We do the Linux Action Show live on Sundays. Now, I, I thought maybe the signal wouldn't make it out. It's so foggy. It's so cold here in Pacific Northwest. The equipment wasn't working this morning. My camera wasn't sending picture. Uh, This computer's USB died on me, and it was was Mm. a madhouse in here this morning, Matt. But somehow it all came together at the last moment so we could be live. And uh, I'd love to have you guys join us Sundays, 10 a.m. Pacific, over at jblive.tv. And you can join our chat room, which is always going. And tell me what I'm getting wrong as I do it, which is nice. You know, well, there's a lot of great stuff that happens behind the scenes that people don't get to see. There's a lot of conversation and dialogue between, between us segments. and the chat room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's about double the amount of show when you mm-hmm. tune in live. So, uh, all right, Matt. Well, before we get to our picks this week, I want to say good morning to the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com, longtime sponsors of the Linux Action Show. And GoDaddy is rocking a very very special promo that we've told you about, we've been telling you about for a little while, but it does expire at the end of. January. That is oh. the current month. And if you guys are not familiar, there's this thing called time. It's uh, it's involved with space. 
And at the eventually, if time continues, which I have every reason to believe it will, this special promo that we have will run out. It is what we call expires. And uh, check this out. If you use our code when you check out over at GoDaddy.com, you get a .com for $2.95. $2.95 if you use the code Linux295. It's almost done. It's almost done. But you got to take advantage of that because that is such a ridiculously great deal. Uh, Danica Patrick is personally catapulting down onto the top from 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 the parking lot onto the top of the GoDaddy parking lot. Then she goes down the chimney, busts into their data center, and steals these dot coms for you. That's why they're so cheap. It's unbelievable. But that is so awesome. She's got to go back to racing soon, so she's got to do that at the end of January. So sure. go use our code Linux two ninety five when you check out, and you'll support the show. Also, if you want to do like some renewals, maybe you want to get yourself a little bit of that that there hosting. Mm-hmm, sure do. Just use our code Go twenty off six when you check out, and you get twenty percent off the whole order. Boom, twenty percent off the top. You want to be like Mitt Romney and bring the rates down? That's how you do it. That's how you do it. <laughs> go twenty off six. Good when times. Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been using the heck out of both of those codes, and it's it has saved me a ton of money. And uh, Danica is watching live, and uh, yes, Danica, you know our post show rituals. You don't have to ask me. All right, Matt. Well, why don't we move on to? Oh, and thank you to GoDaddy for uh, sponsoring Linux Action Show. Why don't we move on to the picks this week? I've got right. one that uh, I'll be honest. It is the first Android app pick I have ever done. I believe. That I have never tried. I can't. I, I can't at least remember. I've never made a pick. I think that I haven't at least tried. Sure. But this one is not compatible with any of the devices that I own. It is, however, compatible. I believe with the vast majority of handsets that have been out for a little while, like uh, the Droids, like the mm-hmm. HTC Ones, and a lot of the HTC handsets, uh, the Evos, and things like that. So uh, I. It, but it does not work on my Nexus Seven or my Galaxy Nexus. And those are the two current Android devices that I use, so I wasn't right. able to test it. But I, I want to put on your radar because it's, a, it's an open source piece of software that we all love, and their beta will soon be adding a lot more devices, and it's VLC for Android. Now, this is, I've been told, now again, I haven't been able to try it, but I've been told this is from the official VLC folks, and their goal here is to make the full-fledged VLC media player for the Android device. You know, so you can play your AUG files, you can play your MKV files, you can just nice. scan your SD card or your Dropbox folder, and it'll just automatically play all this stuff. Now, uh, I'm, I'm uh, just itching to get my hands on it, so if anybody out there has tried this, I'd love to hear uh, your opinions of it, but, you know, obviously, VLC, one of my favorite open source programs. I love this program. And, oh, it's uh, such a time saver. I mean, you don't have to stop and think about what's going to be compatible video-wise. You can just play it. Yeah, Any exactly. You don't have, have to worry about Bam. it. You, you know VLC will take care of it. Mm-hmm. So anyways, uh, I, you, or I'll put a link to it uh, in the uh, chat room right now if uh, any of you guys in the chat room want to go get your hands on it. And uh, let me know how it works for you. And then as soon as they make it available for my device, I'm going to try it out. Definitely. And, of course, uh, pit links to all of our previous Android picks are in the show notes. Just go to Jupiter Broadcasting. Look for this episode of the Linux Action Show, Season 25, Episode 4. And uh, then look in the show notes for the Android picks and uh, previous picks, too. All there in a nice long list. And if you've got a new Android device or you're looking for a particular type of app, go there because I've probably picked it. And uh, those are all my favorite ones. Sweet. Now let's talk about an app pick that I may have mentioned, I don't think on this show, but I did on Coda mm. Radio. It's made okay. by a community member. He's active in uh, our subreddit. He, uh, he often emails into our shows. And uh, it is a very handy Python script to back up your IMAP inbox to an this HTML5 awesome. folder in, yeah. and index. Yeah, yeah. You saw this on the subreddit? I saw, I was, I, not only did I see it, when I saw it on the show notes, I, I actually grabbed it. I'm going to be playing <laughs> with it later today. I'm thinking this is so much better than what I've been doing. Yeah. This is so much better than like backing up to Thunderbird or whatever. Um, that, to actually have just good old fashioned HTML files that I can, I mean, sh- right. Come just on. easy That's to manage, awesome. and uh, it's yeah. so it's called uh, NoPrivPy, uh, and uh, NoPriv.py is a Python script to back up any IMAP capable email account to an HTML archive, nicely browsable instead of weird folders, uh, one or like one huge file like an inbox, and uh, only needing a web browser to view. Uh, no proprietary code, so you can make sure uh, it won't steal your password and things like that. He's got screenshots of it here. And uh, it looks really nice. And I, of course, uh, my inbox is a monster. And it, it is getting so large now that uh, when I set up Thunderbird, uh, this isn't see, this is one of the reasons actually I use Geary now, but I still use Thunderbird from time to time. And I, I set it up at night, and then I go to bed. So that way Thunderbird has all night to download and process my folder. And it's usually still working on it in the morning and well into the day. Uh, My inbox has just gotten unmanageable. So being able to export it to something like this that for me is 
it's something like I can come back to a year from now and I'm, I'm going to know how, where I'm at, how to find things. And that's really important because he also will pull down the attachments and all of that kind of stuff. And it's, it looks like a really great script. And it also has a command line interface, which we've had a lot of uh, command line picks lately. So uh, I know that might be uh, popular with some folks. What, here's where the rubber hits the road for me personally. And this is what really sold me on it is like you were describing with Thunderbird, you're doing your backup. What happens if one day you get to a point to where you try that process you described and Thunderbird just chokes? Uh-oh. So then you try another email client. Uh-oh, it's choking too. You're out of luck. But with this, you're still able to recover those emails and save them in a secure, you know, in a safe, secure manner. Right. That, that's really critical. Well, I, don't I, think could, people, yeah. I was thinking I would, I don't know how big it would be with my inbox, but if mm-hmm. it's not too large, I was thinking I would just make the HTML files and all that stuff in my Dropbox. Right. And then just, I would have that in there and that's always synced and backed up. And then I can browse my archive in any computer I have Dropbox. Uh, the other thing he's done with it, Obviously, uh, it supports HTML emails and you know anything like that. But what I like too is you can also ins- you can also have it back up to um, to the Mailder format. So oh, yeah. so then you could attach it to any mail client that supports Mailder, which is like you know mm-hmm. any of the popular Linux clients uh, or uh, many of the command line ones. And then you can browse it like you would a standard mailbox directory too offline. Which so that's a really nice feature as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyways, he just uh, he just the, with the with the new release. The reason why I want to make it the pick is he just introduced incremental backups, and uh, that was kind of the key part for me is something that could do inter- incremental backups for your inbox, so I can run it once, get the huge snapshot, clean it up, and then say maybe once a week, just do a. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Here's what I'm thinking. Throw it on my server. Do a cron right. job every Saturday night. It does an incremental backup of my inbox, and you know then I can go in there and clear those things out. That's Not what I'm thinking. So I think I might try that. So I anyways, like that. Yeah. Anyways, if uh, you huh. want something like that, it's called NoPriv.py. We have uh, or py. We have a link to that in the show notes. And uh, thanks to Remy for uh, sending that into the show. And uh, you can find his link to his blog and uh, check out the other stuff he has on there too. So that's cool. super. Yeah, I'll have to report back on my experiences with it because what a great backup tool. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, uh, he, when he started working on it, he sent in the idea to Coda Radio and told us a little bit about it. So I've been following it for a little bit, and then he uh, just recently – this is – okay. So this is the great thing about our subreddit is uh, I'm always watching for people who uh, I recognize as good, solid, steady contributors to the, to the show in some capacity. Either if it's mm-hmm. – you know, I recognize their name on email and maybe on the subreddit or in the IRC. And that's a big one, right? The IRC chat right. room and the subreddit. And so when I see contri- contributions, I mean, yeah, some people might look at that and say that's, that's blog spam. But if it's the right content, I look at that and say, well, that's an active member of our community who's building something cool, and that's what open source is about. Right. And so it's just right. about finding those things. So we're going to have another link in the news section that's from another audience member's blog. And as long as they're producing content that's valuable to the community, I love that we can sometimes feature some of that in the show and get them a little bit of traffic. So uh, if you have something great or if you have a news story or a question, something like that, go over to our subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Submit it there. You can vote up and down on stories, which is super important too. Make comments. And your comments are really appreciated because those are sometimes different perspectives than we have, and it helps us sort of reflect a little more on the story and, and look at it from a different angle. So even just commenting is always really appreciated as well. Oh, totally. So you can find well, It's just there. such a great community there because a lot of yeah. times, especially if there's a correction needed or maybe there's an additional fact that needs to be included, it's yeah. a great, great opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Do a, sometimes it's nice to do a little uh, FUD busting. You know? Exactly. And then, and then we sort of filter that crap out before it makes it into the show. And then we're not spreading FUD. Right? Right. Nobody wants to step in FUD, spread FUD, or do anything else with FUD. It stinks. It stinks. Yeah, it's just nasty. I know what you mean, Matt. All right. Well, that's everything at the top of the show. So let's do the news. Hey, what's new in the news? All right, Matt. Our top story, because it makes me smile just a little bit. The GNOME project, GNOME 3 project, I should say, is being forked. Again. <laughs> no kidding. Put a fork well, in it, it, it's done, right? Kind of. Uh, so you know the folks behind Solo S. Uh, sure. They have a post here that say it's official. We forked Gnome Classic, the fallback mode, which has, uh, you know, had a turbulent ride as of recent. And uh, this is uh, something they've been kind of considering for a while. They're calling it Consort. And they right. say uh, it's very simple. They're calling it Consort because it's the desktop that always accompanies you. Why did they fork it? Well... Mainly to protect the users of our desktop components, they say. Pinning patched packages higher than underlying packages proves far too tricky. The amount of patches in each mentioned component qualifies fork status anyways, so it was time to admit it. 
<laughs> some projects were, were well underway, such as Athena and Consort Panel. Athena is their file manager. And some brand new things, such as the Consortium Window Manager. Okay, I can, I can see the logic. And once, they, once you got through the explanation, I can totally see what their motivation was. Because truly, it is nothing worse than going to uh, release your next uh, release and finding out that your desktop is completely worked. So, yeah, I, I can see that. It gives them a kind of a, like a cinnamon is to Linux Mint. It gives them some control right. over what's going so that, on. That was my first question, is how does this differ from cinnamon? How does this All maybe right. differ from mate? Because listen to this, and, and uh, you'll see why I'm bringing up mate here. Uh, they mm-hmm. say, with our forks, we can maintain an experience virtually identical to GNOME 2 but vastly improved with no need for hardware acceleration, such as with GNOME Shell or Cinnamon. Interesting. So uh, they're saying, we're going to bring you a modern desktop based on modern components. See, that's one of the criticisms of Mate 2 is right. it's, it's an older technology, right? or Mate is it's an older technology. So they're going to maintain that. They're going to give you a nice user experience using the GNOME 3 fallback stuff. They forked no hardware compositing required. I, you know, at least they have a clear direction. I I'm, would like to see it in action, but I, I like the idea. I definitely like the idea. No, I'm not skeptical. I think it sounds cool. So <laughs> It's interesting. It, it definitely looks it, – I, I, as an old GNOME 2 guy, I really like the look of it. They've got a very right. clean-looking setup to it. Uh, I definitely uh, am going to give it uh, – I'm going to keep an eye on it and maybe can give it some consideration. The right. thing that they're doing uh, that I think is the bigger story here, sort of the, the story within the story is uh, – there does seem to be a crisis of confidence in a GNOME 3 shell, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, oh, don't yeah. think, I don't think people are really so much eschewing the GNOME 3 technology so much as, as GNOME 3 shell. And uh, next month, uh, I believe the uh, core GNOME development team is getting together to sort of talk about the future of GNOME. And one of the things in their discussion is uh, they feel like they need to address the lack of trust and faith that people have in them to move the GNOME desktop forward in a direction people want. Like, they're acknowledging right. that there's this issue, and they're planning to talk about it. And now you look at Cinnamon, uh, you look at Consort, you look at Mate, you look at Unity, I believe all of these are a vote against GNOME 3 Shell. They are. And I think that while I applaud uh, GNOME's approach to this, I think in reality it's too little too late. Um, so I think that anything they're looking to curb as far as uh, action and uh, direction that other uh, you know, basically forks are going, I think it's just too late. I think that GNOME is going to basically have to accept what it is. And people um, really are looking for alternatives. You're That's right. Been, you know. No, you're right. And uh, I think uh, I think they have uh, sort of this mentality, Solo S says, that, uh, you know, our, our decision is about maintaining user experience. We feel that the GNOME 3 developers' decisions are more about appeasing what developers want to do. Right, exactly. That's There's been some my logic experience. to that. There's some logic to that. So, anyways, we'll see. Yeah. You know, it might we'll not see. go anywhere, but I just think it's an interesting milestone, mm-hmm. and and it's just sort of an event that happens right before that big no meeting that uh, we'll talk about more when it actually does happen. Well, you know, and any dialogue is good dialogue. So I, I applaud them for at least having the conversation. I wouldn't expect a lot to come of it, though. Yeah, and you know, if nothing else, even if it just sort of stays to Solo S, it's going to give Solo S an interesting, compelling, mm-hmm. different differentiator. Exactly. That, uh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. All right, Matt. Well, just a quick mention because it's one of the Linux Action Show audience favorites. Uh, Warzone tw- oh, yeah. uh, 2100 just released a new version, version 3.1.0. It's been a long time coming, over two and a half years worth of bug fixes and improvements. It's just a small team of developers, but they've pushed ahead, continuing to improve Warzone 2100. Uh, you can expect quicker releases as they get closer to the 3.1.0 release. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, they now have perfectly synced multiplayer games thanks to uh, Sype. The, uh, the developer Sype, uh, something that no other version of Warzone has ever had. And I, I, uh, I don't know if you've ever looked at it, Matt. Warzone is sort of like an overhead strategy war game. Okay. With, uh, different, with different, you know, uh, you know war, different war weapons and things right. like that. Yeah. People, <laughs> okay. people talk about it in the chat room all the time. So I wanted to give it a special mention. Yeah. Now, here's the one. I'm, I don't play Warzone myself. But I am already so buying this next one, Matt. It is ridiculous. <laughs> I am so excited about this. The Cave is coming to Linux next week, so the week this Ooh. comes out. Uh, the Cave is a platform adventure game that is being developed for all major platforms, Linux being one of them. And uh, it, uh, it's a highly anticipated amongst gamers. It, its original work, uh, it was, uh, development was led by a game designer known for several classic games from LucasArts. The Cave is a new adventure game from the people who created Monkey Island, uh, Maniac Mansion... It's all from Ron Gilbert. 
And uh, on my videos, nice. I was going to show off the uh, gameplay because it looks incredible, but uh, YouTube is deciding to... Uh, there we go. Kind of crap out of here? Yeah, oh, there no, we there we go. There it is. It looks... You can probably hear it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's got really good music, too. Yeah. I mean, that looks like a That's ton awesome. of fun. Uh, so, anyways, it'll be The Cave. It'll be out in Steam, on Steam, uh, next week. And uh, you can guarantee if, uh, if I miss a show this week or mm -hmm. if next week's Linux Action Show is uh, half-baked, it's because I spent too much time playing this game. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have gamer thumbs and yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, uh, so that's the cave, and I, it says highly anticipated, and it's not kidding, Matt. I now you and I were actually talking about maybe doing a little gaming episode we next were. week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I think it's definitely time. I think it's time, and I think we can put together something that will appeal to a little bit of everybody. Yeah. So if uh, and one of the things we're going to want to focus on is Kickstarter games that are coming to Linux. So if you know of a Kickstarter project, submit it to the subreddit or send it into Linux Action Show at JupiterBroadcasting.com. A Kickstarter that either already has Linux game funding locked in or is mm -hmm. really really close. Uh, but Matt, Love now I want to I, I want to do a little dust up. We're going to do a little dust okay. up now. You know uh, John O'Bacon, friend of the show. Yes. And uh, he is, he's fired back up his Q&A sessions that he does. And in his recent Q&A, he said something that's interesting about what Ubuntu's possible intentions are with Wayland in the future and yes. maybe skipping Wayland and rolling their own window manager. I want to play this clip, and then I want to talk about what he says. Now, again, this is not a for sure thing. Mm -hmm. This is just going to be an interesting point of discussion. It's not actually, sure. you know, nothing's actually been decided, and it's just Jono kind of going off the cuff talking about it loosely. So, okay. But we'll play it. We'll see what he says. It's essentially a replacement for X. It's a different way of working. Uh, and we looked at Wayland, and Wayland looks, oh. Wayland looks interesting. When it first came out, uh, when it was first announced, it seemed like something that would be very suitable for us. Um, and back then, we were just looking at, you know, Ubuntu desktop. And now we care about desktop and phone and tablet and TV. So when we assess a drawing layer, we're really assessing a drawing layer that is going to be applicable to each of these different different form factors. It's not if we only care cared about the desktop, then it's a different set of considerations to caring about whether something's going to run run, for example, on um, an embedded device like a phone, which is running an ARM chip and half an, and half a gigabyte of, of RAM, as an example. So one of the things that we came, one of the conclusions we came to is that you know it wasn't just a yes or no decision about Wayland. We need to look at our, our other alternatives as well. And those considerations are still going on. We're still looking into it. Um, there is a pretty reasonable likelihood that we may roll our own. We've been exploring the possibility of, of uh, building our own display server um, to see if that's going to be a more efficient um, way of delivering what we need. Um, but we're still, it's still very much up in the air right now. We're still assessing these different options. Um, the good news is that for users, it, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. The only thing that's going to, that you're going to see is, is, is um, graphics performance on your desktop, your phone, whatever else is going to be better. Uh, because whatever we choose, it will be better than X. That's, that's, that's the, the consistent, um, consistent viewpoint. So uh, what do you think of that, Matt? What are your initial impressions? I, I ha there's two thoughts that I have on this. First of all, uh, from their perspective, not mine, but from their perspective, I get it. For their goals, they're trying to basically be all things to all different devices and so that sort of thing. And and get, by giving themselves control of that, that makes sense. Second, or, second to that, uh, it, later on in the interview or another part of it, he was talking about the age of uh, X itself X, right. and how antiquated it is. And right. I agree with that completely. I definitely think it's time to move on to something else that's not as problematic. Myself, where I have concerns, however, is looking at, you know, what's that really going to mean when it comes to, uh, for instance, I run uh, dual desktop. Uh, you know, is that going to be a problem? Is that going to be on their to-do list of bugs? Uh, that's going to be, you know, what types of challenges does this present as they begin to roll something brand new out? Because when you roll a project like this out, like they did with Unity, it's not just ready to go out of the box. It's a long haul of bug fixes. And I, I don't have the patience for that right now. So I, yeah. I'm a little skeptical. The yeah, idea you're right. sound. It would but, be yeah. like it would be like uh, uh, introducing a major 1.0 yeah. into a very sort of touchy stack. Right. Uh, and the other thing that uh, sort of leaps out at me in that in that just kind of off the cuff conversation mm -hmm. is uh, the, the the thing he said there was if the desktop was our own only consideration we would have we would just go with Wayland. Exactly. And while <clears throat> Wayland is still at this point to, to, for all practical purposes, vaporware to us. Although it is not, there's code, and you can there go is. get Rebecca Black Linux if you want and play with it. Uh, I would just say, you know, that concerns me because 
the desktop for me is what I care about the most right now. And I just never, I just never want to see an environment where the best decision for the desktop is being passed over for consideration of potential other platforms that may or may not be successful. And I, yeah, I, I don't know if that's what's happening here. And, and like Jono did say, it, probably anything they went with would be an improvement, maybe. But I do kind of wish that, like, the desktop was almost just being spun off into its own group at this point a little bit. Well, and it, it's going to happen. And, and building from this, one other thing that I've noticed is that the all, all the Linux distributions in general – you know, ten years ago, five years ago, it was very cooperative in nature. Nowadays, not even remotely. Everybody is offshooting everything. Windows yeah. managers and yeah. everybody's, you know, I mean, everybody's trying to become so centralized in their own vision. And I always worry about that, wasted efforts and like duplicate, you know, like yeah. multiple tracks and people could just work together and save time. Uh, well, and and I think what's going to happen is uh, eventually you're going to see. Kind of the dust. I think the dust is finally going to end up settling, and you're going to have the de facto uh, geek distribution, which I honestly think will be Arch, no question about it. I think you'll have the de facto Ubuntu type situation, whatever that may be. Maybe Ubuntu, maybe a derivative, and then you'll have something that kind of meets in the middle of the enterprisey feel, like a an open SUSE or something like that. I, th I think you'll kind of have those. You'll end up with like three, and you know, I, I'm definitely. I, I'm really on the fence. And like I said, I get where he's coming from. I totally get the value of what they're trying to do. Because of their goal set, they do need to do this. I, I get – I totally understand that. But you think – do you, you think know, like – okay, look at it. Let's, let's fast forward two years. Sure. Now, where say 80 percent, maybe all, all distributions except for the ones that are either Ubuntu or heavily based off Ubuntu, maybe say Mint. Right. Uh, um, they're all, but all the other guys are probably going to be on System D. And maybe two yeah. years from now, they'll be using Wayland. Uh, for their for their windowing servers, so mm -hmm. uh, you have like these major changes in in architecture that Ubuntu is going to you know Ubuntu will be using Upstart, not Systemd. Ubuntu will be using uh, the canonical Magical Window Manager, and uh, really they're going to get to a point where and they're using their own desktop uh, right. interface, and they're using their own software store. They're really kind of mm -hmm. almost going to more image mirror the Android model. They are. Than they are sort of the standard distribution model. Now, that's not necessarily to say that strategy is not going to work, but I worry, uh, you know, that that's just not a direction I want it to go in. And I would, I would probably argue the vast majority of current users who are aware of these types of technologies and standards and things like that wouldn't want mm -hmm. that to happen either. But the the bigger ramifications would be as application developers are moving over to Ubuntu at a very rapid pace now. I mean, obviously Valve's the big one, but you have Lightworks and other ones. Uh, what are their options going to be? Are they going to continue right. to support Ubuntu and then sort of become kind of locked in? Uh, will they? Will they? Uh, will they not? Will they? Will they kind of pull back? I mean, what what's the ramifications of of this? Well, see, here here's what I see happening, and and this is not great from an open source community perspective, but from the uh, proprietary developers, uh, you know, such as Valve and that sort of thing, I I can see them looking at this as attractive because they're no longer dealing with stepladder tiers of uh, possible uh, regressions or bugs or things like that coming up. You're Instead, you're dealing with one company. So if there's an issue with the, yeah. uh, the display setup, they're dealing with one company because they're right. not, they don't care about the, the politics of the software. They really don't. They're looking at dollars and cents and audience. And if whoever provides that wins, and that in this case will be Ubuntu. Right. If Valve um, says we need this right. tweak made so that way we can get 15 more frames per second, exactly. it, it is easier for Canonical to deliver on that. And it's just it's just less hassle for them. So if they've compartment, if you know, if Ubuntu has been able to compartmentalize that to where they're basically doing their own thing on all these different levels, and they're able to back it up and not really blow it, um, which you know who knows. But I think early on it's going to be a challenge. But down the road, I think I think they'll do pretty well with it. You know, I, I think that could be good for them. And the beauty of it is, is that for myself, during those early early periods while they're doing this, I probably am going to end up dropping the distribution and going to an offshoot while they're working through all this stuff, and then maybe returning to it when they've gotten their bugs figured out. And that's, and the, that's the best the part beauty. about it, yeah. right? That is the best part about it, is we can do that. We're not sure. up. It's not like it's not like when Windows just decides. Metro, baby! Everybody, goes, totally. everybody's going metro. Let's do the metro show, and then the users like either stick with the old version that just keeps getting older and older and older and more vulnerable, right. or they move to metro, and those are their two options, right? Exactly. Uh, well, and the, so and the nice last wheel. thing I wanted to bring up too is now with system builders, this is going to be a big deal. They, you know, a Canonical and, and Ubuntu and all this have really got to make sure they're working with them very effectively to not 
you know, create issues for them that they should not be experiencing. Right now, everybody's kind of got a system that works for them, and they're able to work amongst that system. But I'm hoping that they're really working uh, with kind of an OEM kind of uh, situation and making sure that they have the tools that are needed as they go through this process. Because there are companies out there that push Ubuntu really hard. Yeah. And that, that concerns me, especially mm-hmm. as they begin to migrate this direction. Don't get don't put the cart ahead of the horse. Take your time with it. Don't and who knows something you know, early, you know. We know. You never know. They might go with Wayland sure. and uh, everybody might just be uh singing Kumbaya forever. So, we don't right, have to worry right. about it. Uh all right. Well, the probably yeah. the Oh, go ahead. Any last thoughts? Oh, no, no, that's pretty much it, you know. Okay. More power to them. Hope it works out. We'll wait and see. Wait and see, yeah. Yeah. Uh so I guess does that mean then the current Ubuntu phones are using X11? Don't know. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I, Org, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I. They might be. They must be. I guess so. Uh, yeah. All right, Matt. <laughs> Weird. So, so uh, we kind of buried the lead, but I wanted to give us a little room to talk about it. The, probably the big story this week was the release of Fedora 18. Right. After some delays, uh, the uh, spherical cow hit the web, and uh, Fedora 18 packs a punch in a few areas. We've got this is our meta coverage. This is kind of the first time we've tried doing this. Um, and we're going to just kind of point you to everybody else's coverage. Uh, uh, up up first, uh, the H Online has a great what's new in Fedora 18 write-up that spans a couple of pages, includes screenshots of both the GNOME environment and the KDE environment. And honestly, to me, the KDE environment is looking really good. Uh, of course, then I click on the screenshot and it brings up the GNOME environment. What kind of... What kind of <laughs> <laughs> How did they do that? Uh, you know, clearly, they got their links mixed up. But yep. uh, Of course, one of the big features in Fedora 18 now is uh, better support for uh, the secure UEFI booting. And uh, probably Good. the thing that's had the most controversial reception mm-hmm. is that new installer. Yes, yes, yeah, and I and I definitely think that's something that's going to have to wait and see how that's going to yeah. pan out. But there, there have been some people have been up in arms about it. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, uh, so the new installer huh. was also sort of the thing that uh, kind of caused a lot of delay for uh, Fedora. Uh, now, I would say, I, I've linked to a blog that is the most critical about the uh, new installer, and here's the primary critiques that I, I feel like I would agree with, too, is the installer uh, sort of has this mix between a touch UI and mm-hmm. a desktop UI, but it, it doesn't really work very well. Like, uh, you know, it, it takes up a lot of space for, for small things, uh, right. but what he really took a lot of issue with was uh, the disk partitioner, and I, this is what yeah. I've heard the most complaints about. He says... Uh, uh, you get uh, you get disrepresented represented visually. That's it, not by their names, but by identical identical icons with labels that refer to the actual disk model, not slash dev sda or slash dev sdb, which oh, is what wow. you would expect. You get the manufacturer's model strings. As he happens to own two identical disks, this makes it pretty difficult. Uh, now, here's the other thing that they do that's a little crazy: is the installer also lists the drives in reverse order. So Dev SDB is actually first, and Dev SDA is actually second in the list. So let um, me let me get this straight. Not only did, did they make it visually unusable as possible, in my opinion, but then they did everything backwards so that by any sm- some small miracle you have a, able to mentally picture what the heck drive represents which. Then they reversed it so that goes right out the window. I mean. Yeah, the drive. That's he, terrible. He spends quite a bit of time in the review, kind of slamming the installer. And I got to be honest with you, yeah. I, I really feel like these echo what I would think here. Now, you can't base your entire opinion on a on a release on the installer, no. but the reason why I'm focusing on it is because it's something that I've touched on before. Do you remember I was really upset that time? I don't know. I probably shouldn't have gotten so upset, but I just thought it was so <laughs> ridiculous that Fedora shipped with a volume slider applet that couldn't actually control the volume. And I, I thought, think that, uh, no, I, th- I agree with you on that. I definitely think that's and, pretty. And so, to me, up. what you just have to realize, and this is probably why Fedora should just switch to a rele- uh, rolling release. As a Fedora user, you are a beta tester for mm. the larger distributions. This installer, to me, and you can read the rest of this review if you want to, but this installer, to me, in my opinion, if I was a release manager, wouldn't have gone out the door. We would have shipped with Anaconda, which was a great installer, a great yeah. interface, one of my favorite Linux distribution installers. We would, for one more release, and continue to test internally. Now, I know Fedora's philosophy, and I can respect this, is the only way to get it out there and get it f- fully flushed out is to just get it in the hands of people. But you have sure. to just call it what it is. Those people are beta testers. They are but, beta testing something that eventually Red Hat will sell for very, very large sums of money. Oh, totally. But, you know, th- there's a level of, uh, you know, oh, hey, we missed a bug. And then there's, like, so glaringly obvious that, I mean, un- unless you are, in fact, as the chat room says, drunk, you know, that, you know is Fedora drunk? I mean, truly, you got to kind of wonder what, what mindset says, oh, wow, visually this looks like ass, and so we're going to go ahead and do it this way. I, I don't understand the, the mentality of that because it's not like something – 
some underpinning that might have been missed or a bug or something that's going to be reported or dealt with. This is visually painful for an installer for an otherwise great release you know that has other great benefits yeah. but they kill it because they don't know what the heck drive they're working with i mean that's kind of a he mentions there's other cosmetic things during installation that bothers him quite a bit uh like yeah. the fact that the progress bar stops at 20 percent, but the uh it read out it reads out 100 percent uh you know uh things like these orange pop-ups at the bottom that constantly make it look like you forgot to right. do things even though you <laughs> haven't actually had a chance to do them yet exactly uh he calls it presido touch presido Pseudo touch masturbation. He calls it half touch UI, half non touch UI. Uh, now, okay, but now let's, let's switch gears to positive. The other nice thing sure, about Fedora sure. is you can do GNOME Shell, you you can do Mate, and that's you can nice. do KDE. So you get to pick your own flavor. I think that's really great. Uh, there, I believe they've marked their transition to System D at at eighty percent complete. Mm -hmm. So there's still some work to do there. But I've I've had some conversation with some folks about so there's some transition elements to that. Uh, so you know, uh, overall, if you are a Fedora user and you are ready to embrace the switch to System D and you've been wanting to get your hands on Mate, this seems like probably a great thing to try because you get Mate right out of the box, you get Systemd right out of the box, and then with the we have a link to a blog in uh, the show notes, which is uh, titled uh, Fedora... Where, he, where did I put it? There's a link in there about getting the most out of Fedora, and if you follow that link, uh, the link will tell you how to get... Yeah, Fedora tips and tricks. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, from uh, Cracked Node, the cracknoodle.com blog, which mm -hmm. was submitted to the subreddit this morning, and it's uh, utilities for getting Fedora sort of a little setup, you know, getting things sure. like DVD playback and codecs and anti-aliasing and colors mm -hmm. in your terminal. That's cool. Uh, That's adding cool. the RPM Fusion repos, which has a bunch of great software and things like that. Well, and I have a Fedora tip that I want to share with everybody. It's if you're trying to partition the new release, I recommend using another partition manager. Uh, you grab your camera phone and you take a picture of the different sizing because you won't have any reference, of course, when you're using their partitioner. And then when you go back into install Fedora, you just look at the picture and then match those up. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Just uh, hold it up with Come one on. hand. Oh, and then, my. Uh, actually, you know what you could do? Seriously? Oh, my. Maybe. I don't know. But maybe yeah. you could, like, boot it off of, like, an Ubuntu live CD and use GPUTED. Right. And then that's kind of what I was thinking. Fedora. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I'm making fun of it, but I mean, but it's true. That's kind of what they've left you as far as options, unless you have a visual cue as to what. Because that's, that's a bad. That's a big deal. It's not like it's, oh, hey, look, that applet doesn't work, or, hey, look, that crashes, or whatever. I mean, this is like, I'm trying to get my partition set up. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. <laughs> also, uh, thanks to uh, Tushcrant, in the Tushcrant 15 in the uh, subreddit, he started a thread on uh, getting folks' uh, initial opinions on their Fedora 18 installations. Mm -hmm. He overall is pretty positive, except for he, uh, he did take issue also with the installer, mentioned it crashed twice and nuked his grub. But then once he got mm -hmm. that going, he says it's, it's a good-looking Fedora OS that runs pretty peppy. And we have, uh, so anyways, if you'd like, you can, mm -hmm. we'll link to this in the show notes. You can uh, toss your experiences with Fedora 18, positive or negative. And it looks like a lot of people have some positive ones in here. Yeah. Uh, you can uh, share it in there. I, I say, I say, you know, Fedora 18 is interesting. Fedora 19, they're already making the plans. Uh, we have a link to that, too. If you can believe it, the uh, Fedora 19 talk has already started. And I think it's interesting. I wonder if after Fedora 19, we'll see them go to rolling. It's going to be called... Uh, that would be interesting. Schroeder's mm -hmm. Cat, is that how you say it? Sh uh, Schoinders? Schoinders? Schwank, sh 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 But uh, Fedora 19 will have Enlightenment 17 in there, E17. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to have something called Early Video, which I want to check out. It's a modern open source streaming server. It's going to have Ruby 2.0 and uh, mm -hmm. the new Bind 10, which is a complete rewrite nice. of the Bind DNS software, will be in Fedora 19. So and see, are, that's what are, kills me is they do all this great stuff. You know, it's not like I, I'm hating on the distro. I'm not. I just I want to get to use it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, just saying. You, you like, know, maybe on. Fedora. Maybe if Fedora goes rolling and they get some of these yeah. transitions uh, worked out, uh, installer gets some love. Maybe it'll become a great base for spins. There we go. You know, there and then go. you could have That'd some. Work. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows, right? Yeah, I'd and be they right kind with of that. they could kind of you know become like uh, kind of like Debian is to some of the other distros that are out there, but also still <laughs> a distro folks can use that. It's great. Like I just saw, Debian's almost reached thirty, almost thirty three percent of the Linux market share on the web for web servers. Wow. You know that's a really wow. big number. So obviously, I'm not downplaying Debian at all, but. There's sort of a role they play. I view as sort of an infrastructure operating system mm -hmm. for a lot of folks too. And Fedora. Sure. Maybe could play that. I don't know. That we'll would see. be cool. All right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. 
time to talk about one of the most little interesting distributions around, and the timing couldn't be better because E17 just finally hit stable after, uh, it's like a what was it, a decade of development? And how long were they? I think a decade, a decade and a half. or something. Was it they were working on it since I believe 1872? Uh, the E17 desktop. So I've been I've been following it for a long time, but now to actually see a stable release, and uh, with with uh, Bodai being like the perfect place to try it, I'm I was pretty excited to look at this. So Matt and I are going to share our thoughts on this interesting distribution and introduce you to it and why it's kind of worth worth your mm-hmm. attention. Before we do that, I want to say thank you to System76 for sponsoring this segment of the Linux Action Show. Now, System76, they make machines designed, built to run Ubuntu Linux. They do. That means stuff out of the box just works hassle-free. Just like my Bonobo right here that I have, and uh, the Bonobo laptop is uh, a monster. I I loaded uh, Booty on a, a spare. I have two drives in this thing, and I because uh, it's a monster. And yeah. I loaded it on the second spare partition, second drive spare partition, Oh my god, it's so fast. It is so fast. (laughs) If you want a desktop killer, I mean, really, it's here, folks. Machines in this form factor are now desktop killers. Mine is a quad-core i7, 3 gigahertz, 16 gigabytes of RAM, dual SSD drives with a massive GTX video card in that thing with 2 gigabytes of video RAM and a 1920 by 1080 display. Tell me that's not going to kill your desktop, and it runs quiet while it does it. I have it right here on the desk while I'm recording the show. With an open mic, and it's with all that power, you think it would be loud, but and it, it was not. quiet. And and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that thing even had a sub. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. It's like whoa. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually watched a movie on it last night, and it sound it sounds great. So that is and, so awesome. And the 1080p screen, if you're watching a 1080 yeah. movie, is just perfect. It is perfect. Uh, of course, System76 has a bunch of great machines that are born to run Ubuntu, but uh, I really love my Bonobo Extreme. Yeah, and if gorgeous. you're looking for a laptop that, for example. Uh, this week, I was running VirtualBox and VMware and my full desktop at the same time, and it is it is without a beat. I had dual monitors. This thing has HDMI at the back. Dual monitors, and I had uh, a Windows XP VM up and a Booty Linux uh, VM up, and and I had a CentOS VM running in VMware all at the same time. I love it. It really helps you push things around. So thank awesome. you to System76 for uh, for supporting uh, the Linux Action Show, and uh, I love my machine. I bought this with my own hard-earned monies. And I use it for my uh, everyday contracting gig and for uh, the show productions. They make such great stuff. And I love the fact that you know it's going to work year after year, release after release. Anything that comes up, they'll deal with it, whether it be on their own with a driver. It's yep. awesome. I agree. All right, Good Matt. Well, let's uh, start with uh, Bodai Linux. And, uh, Bodhi. It, Bodhi. Uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, let's start at the very beginning. Release 2.20 came out at the beginning of January. And uh, this is one we've been wanting to get to for a little bit. And they do something that both Matt and I find pretty compelling. And Matt, you kind of you were kind of explaining it on the pre-show. They kind of called a semi-rolling release. Yeah, or a qua- yeah, a semi or a quasi-rolling release. And yeah. that it, it's not necessarily entirely a, a true rolling release setup. But the fact that you're not missing out on the latest kernels or other uh, related updates that you can have your cake and eat it too without having to, uh, you know, upgrade like so you they would in Ubuntu. So they they base yeah. it on the the way their system works is it's based on the latest and greatest Ubuntu LTS. So obviously in this case Ubuntu 1204. And then they take things like the newer kernels, newer Mm -hmm. packages, and they continue to backport those throughout the life of that LTS, which means this is something we've talked about a lot on the show. You get a good stable base operating system that doesn't change a bunch on you, but your user land applications are kept fresh and they're Mm -hmm. kept up to date with new features. I love this idea, right? And this it's just awesome. I love it. And this is this is something that's completely standalone of the fact that it runs E17, and it's just just how they. But it's involved with that, obviously, as well. But uh, all right, well, let's so let's uh, stop let's stop burying the lead. The big feature is, of course, that it runs the Enlightenment desktop, and yeah. uh, I have it here. Now I ran it. I've ran it in physical machines. I'm resizing it right now. I've ran it in physical machines, and I've ran it in virtual machines, and. Um, Oh, this is so cool. This just came out. All right, so hold on. Let me back up. This is a great example of one of the features that I love about Enlightenment. So I just got this message that came up on my screen. It says, you disabled the screensaver too fast. You get this, Matt, you know, when, like, you're just reading something and the screensaver kicks on. You're like, ah, no, 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 no screensaver, bad screensaver. And it's It's, telling you, hey. It's watching. Yeah, it says, would you like to enable presentation mode and temporarily disable the screensaver? Or you could say, no, but just increase the timeout of my screensaver. And you click that, and now my screensaver timeout is set to be longer. 
Well, and I love that fact because let's say you're wa- uh, you're watching uh, I don't know maybe you're doing Netflix and wine or something you know whatever you maybe maybe YouTube whatever you're you're watching in kind of a big screen environment you don't want the screensaver kicking on but at the same time you don't necessarily want to turn the screensaver off with that presentation mode it solves that problem yeah, yeah. and uh, what a the, great way to do it the way that they uh, the way they describe uh, enlightenment is uh, they say the desktop is the menu. And so right here, when you click on the desktop, your menu comes up. Now, in this particular configuration I have of Bodai, or Booty, uh, it already has a menu. But you, if you click anywhere in a blank space on the desktop, a menu comes up. And then there's a everything is pretty much really close to the surface. You don't have to go very far. So here I am. I, I, bring, I click on my desktop. I bring up my settings menu. And then one menu over is the modes, and there's presentation, and there's offline. So if I hit presentation mode... Uh, I now get a notification saying I've entered presentation mode, and now my power set, my power settings have all automatically adjusted to uh, you know don't nice. put the screen to sleep. Uh, the right. screensaver has been disabled, and all that kind of stuff. It's nice. And then That's when I'm awesome. done with that, I just right click again or just left click again and, and uncheck the presentation mode. I think nice. Bodhi really nailed it with that particular feature. I mean, that, it's features like that that really compelled me. It's like it's got some of the Ubuntu goodness that I'm used to, but it's got these additional features that r- really make me do a double take. So let's talk a little bit about mm. Bodhi. Uh, so the word, the, one, the, word, the word that we keep uh, butchering, because it is kind of difficult, it's, uh, it's <laughs> yeah. a word which uh, actually translates into enlightenment. Thus, it's appropriate name for a distribution that's using the Enlightenment desktop. Uh, Bodhi, Bodhi Linux, like we mentioned, is a semi-rolling release, which is nice. But their, their main goal is they stay with the latest release. As a user, you don't have to reinstall your system every two years, but you get current versions of the applications. I think this is really genius. Yeah. The genius of this, though, of pairing it with E17, E17 is not like, it's not like anything like Unity. It's not anything like... Uh, XFCE in some ways that really matter. Like uh, obviously the standard things like how you manage Windows, virtual desktops, those things are are important. But watch now as let's say here I'll I'll launch a Leafpad and I'll launch Midori, the default uh, okay. browser. Okay. Now uh, as I as I can do, I can actually what they call tile windows, where instead of minimizing, you can take a window and you can. Uh, um, almost like blinds, you can bring it up so that it, it the, the the title bar is still there, and you're getting any updates in the title bar, but it's not minimized exactly. It's just sort of it's sort of been rolled up into the title bar, and that's kind of a neat feature. There's a lot of little uh, polish things in Enlightenment. As I roll over uh, the title bar, the uh, the title animation of which window is becoming active has this has this really nice elegant animation. As I resize mm-hmm. windows, there's these nice little animations that are, are subtle that show up everywhere throughout the operating system. All of this is actually happening using a software compositor, which takes very little CPU usage and performs just as well as a hardware compositor, at least in my testing here. And what is really compelling, Matt, and I, I love this as an approach to how to run a compositor. Right. Let's see if I can find this. So if I go into, uh, there's a section in here where you can actually say, adjust my fanciness based <laughs> adjust on the, your fanciness, right? Based on the frame rate. So wow. I have it locked in so that my desktop is always the the windows and menus are always rendering at 60 frames per second. If the visual effects mm-hmm. compromise 60 frames per second, mm-hmm. it dynamically disables the necessary visual effects so that oh, I continue man. to have a 60 frames per second. Window manager, basically. That's uh, cool. I think I that's like genius. That. But one thing I read uh, elsewhere, and I wanted to question about, is I've heard that the compositing can be a little, uh, little, little clunky. Well, uh, yeah. So here I'll show. Yeah, I, I, I've managed. I've managed to crash it pretty good. If I go into the sure. compositor manager. Uh, and I switch it to to my to a hardware driver mode. It it it'll totally bail. And I actually right. don't know of a way to once you've done that, once you've borked it, I don't know of a way to switch it back. So sure. uh, I actually had to reinstall the operating. Not, not oh, oh. because I was such a fresh install too. I felt it's not worth twenty minutes. I'll just reload. Right. So right. you have to, you do have to be careful. But I have mm-hmm. it. It is it's composited right now. It's using their software compositor, which is awesome. Yeah. And uh, watch. Okay. So now for this will be a treat for you, video folks. But to maintain good performance, like there's enlightenment can be uh, considered. A lot of functionality is added through modules, and different modules add different functionality. And I'm looking at different modules now, and I can see like anything from the clock on the desktop to the launcher menu to your volume controller is all a module, okay? Mm. And these modules can be enabled or disabled depending on what functionality you want 
E17 to have. So as, a, as an example, if I for some reason wanted my desktop to rain, I could load the rain module, and mm-hmm. now on my desktop at all times, I have a rain cloud and raindrops. Now, that might seem silly to you, but this is a really good demonstration of how uh, Enlightenment will continue to adjust the visual effects in real time to try to keep up the 60 frames per second performance. I and, like that. Yeah, and when that's I'm, cool. And when I'm done with it, I just click on my desktop, I go down to modules, and I just unload the rain module. Uh, it, 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 it's... it's it's an it's an interesting approach to uh, it, it's it could give you a very 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 p- pared down desktop which might work mm-hmm. really good for touch devices that have low memory and then with these modules, you can just keep adding additional functionality to E17 so that it can do everything from a launch bar to rain on your desktop. I mean it's just all right. over the place. So what was it like for you jumping in and trying to navigate? Did it just seem totally I, it, foreign? It, no, not necessarily. I, I've used I've used just you know a variety of desktops over the years, so it didn't take me long to adjust to it. I did feel like, and this is something I didn't explore. Um, theming is you know what type of theming options does it oh, have? Because that's something I didn't I didn't have time to really dive into. I was you know there's just a ton here. So let's let's talk about that. And in, in a context of something that's unique to uh, to uh, Bodhi is uh, they have they ship it really bare. So their idea is is it's an absolute minimal application set, mm-hmm. and they only include a handful of themes. But what's okay. really neat is during the installation, I liked it. Do you remember what during the installation it came up and said, what type of setup do you want? Do you want a traditional right. desktop setup? Do you want a fancy compositor setup? Do you want That was awesome. I love yeah, the fact you were presented with that. It was tile, like, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah. yeah. Like you could go awesome type window manager setup to just standard, you know, lower right. bar with a start menu setup. So it gave you those options out of the gate. And then it gives you five themes to choose from. You know, okay, what of like these five or six themes after you've picked your layout do you want to use? Now, once you get into the desktop, it's pretty much bare bones, right? There's not a lot going on. However, if you look around, you'll see they have a, uh, they have a Bodhi Linux uh, a menu, and then you, there's an add software option. Obviously, since this is based on Ubuntu, you've got Synaptic. You've got AppGit sure. on the back end. But they're doing something else special here. They have a web directory listing of software bundles, okay? And in okay. these software bundles, one of the things that they have, see, if we, if we look under... Uh, they have a bunch of different packs. So they have like audio editing packs and they have desktop fun packs and things oh, like nice. that. So in the desktop fun pack, they have like the flame modules, the rain module, and they have a whole bunch of more themes. So, uh, but let's, so I already loaded that. So let's pick something else. Like uh, yeah. I could go internet and let's say web browser, right? Okay. So then uh, I don't have Chromium installed yet, but Chromium is my preferred browser of choice. So I'd say on their webpage, they have a little install now link that comes up. Mm-hmm. And uh, this will fire up uh, Synaptic and give it the uh, source to go get that package. And it'll do the installation of uh, Chromium for me just after I, by clicking the link on their site. So they have, they have the whole application directory there. And so nice. I pulled down like another dozen themes just through, by grabbing one of their theme packs. And I pulled down uh, 64-bit audio editing stuff. So I got Ardor and mm-hmm. Audacity. And I it even brought nice. down OpenShot for a, for a multimedia one that I did. Uh, so there. So now I'm installing. Uh, so now I'm installing Chromium, and uh, I got to put the password in one more time. I like how they bundle things like that together. I think that's what what a what a neat way for discovery. You know. Yeah, Especially it if, is. You know, if you're not familiar with an app, what a great. It's like I know what I'm trying to do, but I may not know the application name. What a what a great way to say, oh hey, that's cool. You know, it, it, I think that's awesome. Yeah, because you just browse the category. I got graphic yeah. editors. I got Office. So you know, they had they had an Acrobat Reader on there. So I was like, mm-hmm. all right, we'll try that, and it went and grabbed exactly. Acrobat Reader just fine. Uh, they have uh, they have one commercial piece of software and they're just crossover office, which is good right. and handy. And they have like a wine category, so you can get wine tricks and stuff like that. So that's got, nice. Yeah, they got all kinds of really great stuff there. Uh, so that's how yeah. they kind of do it. So they figure, you know, advanced users probably just want to load their own software. Sure. And so then once I've got it installed, it's just it just shows up right in the uh, in the menu there. Well, it should show up in the menu there, but it didn't. Um, the other thing that's neat about Enlightenment is this menu system. See, the, it kind of there's a lot going on. But as you add stuff to your favorites, you can right-click and you get a separate just list of your absolutely favorite applications in a much shorter, much more compact menu. It's, it, you can really start booking in Enlightenment. Right. And Enlightenment comes with its own built-in file manager. So uh, I can, uh, let's say, uh, I could go, I'll bring up my home folder here. And this file manager is sort of integrated in with the desktop. It's interesting. It's got some neat features. It it feels a little more limited than, say, Dolphin or, mm-hmm. or Nautilus, but it... You know, moving files around, setting permissions on stuff, it totally works. Pretty standard file manager, yeah. Yeah, so watch. Now that we have a window up, I will uh, go here to my uh, settings, and I'll go here to my themes, 
And again, this just shows you everything is so quickly available, right? I didn't have to load up some sort of system control panel and then go right. to some sort of visual menu and then click on the second tab and then choose from a <laughs> list. I just clicked once on my desktop, went two menus over, and now here's all of my themes. And this one's a little atrocious. I think it's called wood. So I'm, I'm guessing this one's going to be... Uh, Very woody. There we go. Yeah. So yeah. I kind of resized my virtual window, but there you go. So now I've just applied the wood. I actually kind of like it, actually. That's oh, not bad. It's 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 got it's, it's got its own it's got its own kind of appeal to it. What delicious! Yeah. There you go. I mean, I, that just kind of I don't know. I I kind of like that quite a bit. Now, back to the booty guys themselves, the Bodai guys themselves. They have done a few things that I really respect, and I really think other distributions could try. Mm-hmm. Because Enlightenment's so different, they've really focused a lot on their documentation. So they have a really, really good quick start guide that includes uh, the basics of using Enlightenment, which I found to be pretty helpful because they help you understand the concept of shelves, and they help you understand the concept of modules and gadgets and things like that. So making this whole introduction available is, is totally genius, and they've kept it up to date with the current releases of the OS. And... And they go into quite some detail in some of these things, too. I mean, it, it is really actually pretty educational. I was really impressed with the documentation. I think the fact that they are really on the ball with release to release to release it really shows a lot of how serious they're taking this project. And I think that's fantastic. I agree. I agree. And yeah, they're committing, they're committing to, uh, they're committing to uh, five years of support. On, that's nice. You know. That's really nice. I, and now one thing I was wondering with them specifically is, is this another simply Mepis one-man show type of environment, or is this a group of uh, dedicated individuals? And they actually, uh, they, have a, they have an about, about Bode Linux, Bodai Linux, uh, here we go, uh, team. And they oh, actually, good. they talk about, uh, there's, uh, looks like one, two, three, four, five developers that they call out on their site, and then they have... Uh, uh, a handful of web developers and then some sysops, a jack of all trades, some admins, right. some packagers. So they've got, you know, that's it, good. It's, it's well a scrappy, diversified. it's a scrappy tight team. I, I like, like it. it. Well, yeah. and clearly they're doing something right. And I mean, the, the, the what they did with the documentation is great. I love the way they're handling software. I think that's so cool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely. And I think some of the desktop specifics just take a little getting used to. Like you were talking about something not showing up in the menu. I think you actually have to reload Enlightenment. Mm, okay. if I'm not mistaken. I, I believe there's. It's a little bit like a. Uh, some of the, I think like there, open there, box or something like that. But that yeah. said, there are some really neat window management techniques. Like uh, yeah. I can right click on uh, an icon on my, I guess, the closest thing I call it is a launch bar, but whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it, where it has all my, yeah. and I can I can I can have it do things like I can, I can I can stack it, I can lock it to certain desktops, I can remember its position, I can kill the process, mm-hmm. I can take just a screenshot of just that window by right clicking on its icon in the launcher. Sure. I think that's so neat. Yeah. Uh, I can shade and unshade it. That's what they call it, by the way. When I do the, uh, when I, well, I was calling it the the blinds technique, but they call it they right. call it window shading when you roll it up like that. I, I love some of the solutions they have here. And I like the file manager. You click on the desktop. You go down three spots, and then there is your file manager. And you can actually browse the operating system's entire file system from within the menu structure. And when you get to any particular folder that you want to stop at, you just click that folder, and it immediately launches their nice and peppy file manager. Everything really feels like it's at my fingertips immediately. If you combine it with something like Snap... Uh, uh, what do you, you, you use? Snapdix? I use oh, yeah, Gnome that's Doom. what I use. Almost. Snapdix? Is that what you that, use? That and the terminal. Yeah. yeah. If you combine it with Snapdix or Gnome Doom, which is the one I've always go, I know, mm-hmm. always end up going back to, uh, this, this is. This is solid, Matt. This is yeah. really, really solid. I, I, it's solid enough that I'm going to go on record right now and tell you that I'm going to end up putting this on my Triple E. Uh, I, yeah. I'm just, it just, it's so logical. It's such a smart fit. You know, I, I, I was on the, it was between this and one of the Arch derivatives, and I think I'm going to go this direction just because it's such a, such a great distribution. I also, I also yeah. appreciate, by the way, that they're clever enough to include a copy of the Quick Start Guide locally. And one oh, of the yeah. things in there is like troubleshooting your internet connection and things like that. So if you are, if right. you install it and you can't get connected to the net, That's so important. <laughs> right in the yeah. menu, they have the they have the quick start guide, and it's all right there, local. All the HTML files are local, so you can theoretically kind of go through documentation right. to help you get connected to the net. 
I love that. Yeah, and it, it's, it's exactly it. It's it's not so much the you know someone asked, well, can't you get E17 on Archer? I'm sure you can. For me, it's the other niceties that these guys have done. Not just from a hey, this is new experience, this type of stuff, but also just from uh, the way they handle documentation, the way the team set up, the way they're handling uh, the. I think you said a five year uh, support setup. Um, you know, I, I love all that stuff together. It makes me really want to embrace this. Um, I, yeah. I, I'm actually excited about it. Yeah, are you it listening, is exciting. Fedora? <laughs> I'm excited about this. I mean, well, on. and and the advantage to it, like Fedora 19 is going to ship E17. Yeah. Obviously, E17 is available on probably any distro that you, sure. you want to get it yeah. on if you work at it. But it's kind of like what one of the reasons I think OpenSUSE is a really great KDE desktop is because mm -hmm. the guys there really care about KDE and they really they really kind of focus on making it a good experience. That's right. The the Bodhi guys, they're all about E17, and so they know all the trip, all the tricks. They know all of the great software. They know all of the great themes, and and they're gonna make a really great desktop. And it feels, if it doesn't even feel like you're running on an Ubuntu system. There's no software center. That's there's cool. no uh, there's no Ubuntu yeah. branding. It actually feels more like I'm running a Debian box that just points at the Ubuntu repos. Isn't that great though? Because it's like you know if you're if you want an Ubuntu base but you don't want all the other stuff that comes with it, I think this is a really cool alternative. Yeah, I um, guess so. I'm really really happy with it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to report back on what my experiences are as I get this installed because I'm I'm liking it. I love the fact that it's it's not a distro; it's an experience. Right, it is. That's awesome. It is, and E17 is compelling. It's just it's it's right. fresh. It's 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 different, and it's smart, and um, very. I, I really got to stress very. Just so many little tiny minute points of polish, like mm -hmm. the. There's little indicators in the cursor, like when you go to the edge of a window, like it. There's little little things that happen that just are intuitively tell you what's happening, and and when you stretch a window, like it gives you the proportions and the direction you're moving in, and when you Alt tab between applications, things uh, bounce nicely, and it, there's all these little fine points of of finish that it has that I, right. I just really appreciate as an end user. It just feels so slick and so smooth. I do have one complaint, one really, okay. really, 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 really big complaint. Um, the booty guys, the Bodai guys, are nice enough to include a settings panel if you want it for us traditional users who just sure. you know expect to go on. That's what I've been using them for a while. Yeah. If you try to change. I cannot, I cannot express to you the amount of frustration and time I had trying to change my desktop resolution. Really? Now that, now that would, did you, that's did something, you try no, this? something I did not try. It, it okay. didn't even occur to me. I was so busy just exploring. I did not try. So that, your, That's a problem. Your monitor is represented by a monitor icon in this right. otherwise blank panel. Uh, the way you change the resolution is by clicking on it and dragging the monitor around to different sizes. However, if you're watching right now, you'll see that I can only really get it to go smaller most of the time, and I just have to kind of sit here and keep clicking and trying to drag it in the right direction to so try to make it... rather than having a keyboard option of actually slapping some numbers in there. Just or, choosing a know, number, and it's, yeah. it's awkward. And, like, see, like, now I'm accidentally rotating the screen instead of changing the resolution mm -hmm. because I grabbed the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this really frustrating, like... I probably spent an hour trying to change screen resolutions. Uh, That's frustrating. I mean, because then at that point, you're almost forced to go d dropping down to like X-Randar or something. Oh, 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 there I got it. And I don't you even know it? how oh. I got it. Now if I can rotate it back... <laughs> So up uh, almost there we go. I, so, so in that situation, I get where the, what they were trying to do. I mean, it's like, oh, this is cool. It's a very hands-on, tactile experience. Right. But I think they need to follow it up with an alternative of being able to just have a pull-down menu or to manually enter. I, I pull-down menu would be preferable. I don't think that's being built by the uh, by the boat. I no, I'm sure. It's, I'm sure it's an enlightenment situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so. that's you know that's so I'm just saying. But if it's something that they can maybe I don't know add in there or tweak a little, maybe they can it'd be a good spot to sort of polish over a little bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. or just to offer another uh maybe one of the G uh, guis for uh, x randar you know that works it, it is a beautiful distro and uh, they're working towards uh pointing over to the arm for uh, raspberry pi and tablets so uh they're also working on a chromebook release you know i gotta say the enlightenment it's i really cannot stress to you the different the different kind of uh um out of the box, different presentations it can give you. Right. It can work as a. They have they have what's called bare mode, where it's just a bare blank. There's no, there's nothing. They have compositing mode that kind of reminds me of Unity. They have desktop right. mode where you get a lower bar. You have fancy mode. You have That's laptop cool. mode and tablet mode. And all these different modes give you a completely different window manager experience, all using the same core software. So it makes sense that they could target tablets, and so they're doing just that. 
Uh, they're porting to the ARM, they're porting to the Raspberry Pi, and they're uh, also working on the Nexus 7. So uh, they, have, uh, they, have, hmm. they have development builds of Bode Linux running on the Nexus 7 tablet. I'm just stalling while I wait yeah. for the, the Well, and something board. someone in the chat room said regarding the uh, resolution is apparently if you grab it from the, I think it was the upper left corner and drag out, um, that is uh, the uh, go-to way of setting your resolution. Let me double so check the rupper, that. Up, okay, so upper right-hand corner, huh? Or okay. upper left, I think left. it was. Let okay. me see if I can find it. All right. Where to go? Do, 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 do. Uh, so yeah, here yeah. they go. So they have they here they have it running on the Nexus Seven, and they've uh, <laughs> they've adjusted the UI so that it's more touch friendly, and um, they're having a little trouble with OpenGL, but that's where they're working on right now. Right. Really cool. So they're, they got, I, they I got, like it. Yeah. No, I mean, it's got it's got some growing to do, but it's something I feel comfortable putting on a, one of my secondary computers. So upper left hand corner, you say? Upper, yeah. If I remember, upper left hand. Yeah. Let me see here if I can. All right, so here I'll I'll uh, try. So, and I think you drag out if I'm whoever said that. Uh, let me know if I got that wrong. Mm. Do, do, do. Well, I don't. I'm not getting anything. I don't okay, know. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. It's weird. It could be that I have it in VirtualBox, but it also that did. Could it, be. It, yeah, it, actually, I did. I did. It also had. I had a problem with it. Earlier, well, if you're so. running in VirtualBox, resolutions tend to be. They have a mind of their own in general. I don't care what you're running. Um, so, yeah, it's, that, it's, that that very well could be it. Regardless, it's pretty awkward. I was pretty surprised yeah. because the desktop is so elegant and so polished and so smooth all over. Smooth, smooth, smooth. And then you get this, and you're just smacked in the face with, the, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing right now. No, um, I totally – I, I, I agree with it with the, with one disclaimer. I would say I, I get the logic of what they were trying to do. I just yeah. think that they needed to provide an explanation or even some verbiage in there saying, hey, by the way, <laughs> take Mr. Mouse and do this. Because I, I mean, I get, I get the idea. And it, for, you know, while it may not fall into the user usability standpoint right away it, it is kind of tactile i can see the i can see the appeal the other thing so that they've done to add sort of discoverability is uh, and this is one that uh, the chat room's uh, pointing out is they have a, a run everything menu you just click and you hit run everything and it brings up a categorized real nice list of like here's all your different types of so here i'm going to the internet category and then it brings over here's all your web browsers right and it's really simple to use and just a nice list of everything. So the Run Everything menu, if you're trying out Bodhi Linux for the first time, use this maybe to discover stuff and then start breaking off into the menu uh, and uh, enjoy. I mean, it's just so nice. Yeah. No, I, I'm really liking it. I Someone asked me earlier if I would replace Xbuntu with this. And I would say that in many ways, I, I think I might someday, but I probably won't do it on my main machine think, just because of I think of the I would. Yeah, I don't. I mean, Xbone 2 has got some really rough edges. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the fact that I have to actually set up a startup command to get Compiz working is sad. But, um, you know, the fact that I have to take that kind of manual approach. But I would say that I want to I want to spend some more loving, tender time with this on my netbook first to really get the gist of it. Then I'm going to then I would try it and say, OK, let's see how you do dual desktops. Let's see what kind of dragging action we have there. Let's see how that yeah. feels. Yeah. And uh, whether or not I can bring myself to go full time with it. You know, I, 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 could, I might be able to do that. I might be oh. able to do it. I like it. Uh, Kevin in the chat was pointing out, or yeah. Kev Jones, and says that in the run everything, you can also use it as a text launcher. So I could type oh. Chrome. Oh, yeah, I can. And then it, it, it just uh, launches it immediately. That's really nice. Right, right, right. Uh, so one last little point of, oh, dang it, after I did that. So I was going to mention the entire time we were doing this demo, the memory mm -hmm. usage never went above 200 megabytes of RAM. Oh, wow. But I just crossed the 201 megabyte point when I brought up that last <laughs> menu. But you but know, that's still really reasonable, though. Yeah, I mean, I've got a fully oh. up-to-date, modern, stable Linux system that's got the entire back catalog of the Ubuntu repos, and I'm using 200 megabytes of RAM. And I'm not talking, this is software rendered, and it is smooth, it is fast, it is great. I think this is a Ubuntu killer, possibly. I, I, I mean, I still, love, I, I still love XFCE. XFCE is a great distro, but right. if you want something Ubuntu-based, and you want something that's low resources, and you want something that feels modern and fancy... Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely something. It's it's one of those few distributions that really has me doing a double take to where I want to really spend some genuine yeah. time with it. Um, I, I'm excited about it. I, I like I said, I think it's still got it's still got some still got some growing to do in certain areas. That's why I'm not sure I want to bring it to my na main desktop. But I will totally rock this on my netbook. No they got question. a good team. They got a yeah. good team, and I really like their documentation approach. I like their you know Love they've that. obviously their name is well thought out. All, even if it's hard mm -hmm. to say, all this stuff is it's really good indicators as far as distributions that I've watched before. I definitely give it a recommend. Go check out Booty Linux. Uh, Bodai. We have links to all kinds of links in the show notes to their homepage, yeah. to the App Center, to their Google Plus page, to their Quick Start Guide, and all of that stuff. You can find links to everything in the show notes. And Loving it. Great yes. work. 
All right, Matt. Well, that's the Linux Action Show's look at Bodhi Linux. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Matt, what do you say? Cover a little email before we get out of here. Rocks and also maybe scratch our noses because I should. I don't know why I couldn't have done that before I hit record, but. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we've got what? four emails we're going to bang through today, and uh, the first one comes from Philip, and he says, hi, guys. I've recently started to watch the show. Uh, he says, I'm sad I didn't find it sooner. I've got two questions for you, the first of which is maybe more of a community question. And the guys, think about this, because I, I want you to give your opinions in the feedback thread in the subreddit for this week's episode. I'm in a talent program for a large telecommunications company. And one of my tasks is to develop unique product or customer experiences, something that makes people go, wow, that is cool, and preferably something the competition doesn't already do. So as a long-time Linux and completely Windows-free user, I naturally wanted to give GNU Linux an open-source spin. My first, and, and open-source spin. Hmm. My first idea was to make sure all 3G, 4G sticks were made to be Linux compatible, as I have recently had problems with such sticks myself. He's wondering, is this something the user base would be interested in? And are there any other ideas I could propose? It would be great if, uh, if I could help bring Linux to the attention of the higher-ups, if only even a little. Keep in mind this company doesn't actually manufacture any products. It's a cell phone carrier and an ISP. Also, it's truly a, it's, also if it's truly a big idea, it's very unlikely I can actually make it happen. Think subtle but cool. So that could be really neat. So if people have ideas yeah. from that... Uh, maybe you can help him out in our subreddit. Also, now he has a separate question unrelated. Okay. My mother, who is a complete computer novice, has asked me to give her some pointers and introduce her to a working to working on a PC. I need a very user-friendly and stable environment where she doesn't have to use a terminal or even sudo at all. I'm an Arch user myself, so I don't really know what to get. I'm thinking Mint or Ubuntu. Any other suggestions? Thanks and keep up the great work. I would say Mint is probably the best bet, but also making sure, and this is going to sound, some people will roll their eyes at this, but I, one thing I found is that uh, putting the icons on the desktop is going to save you a lot of phone calls um, because then they don't have to even get into the menu. Uh, that, well, regardless of what you choose, that I would make sure that's done. I yeah. would also make sure that updates are not handled and they're turned off unless you're going there to do them manually. They should be done, but they should be done with you present. Yeah, um, Those two things would be my biggies. So. Yeah, I would say agree. Maybe I would say Mint KDE edition because you can get those big plasma widgets with the sure. big icons on there. That Kinda work. Might have a little Windows familiarity if she's used to that at all. Otherwise, all right. the only other direction I might go if you want something really long term that you can eventually go hands off would be just a standard Ubuntu install because that's going to be eventually what most people are going to assume you're using if you're just a standard Joe user and might just make things more compatible down the road. Could I be. Don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's uh, the only th my only concern is with Unity. I've watched people just get completely lost with the uh, the way that works. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, the next one comes from uh, Daxum, and uh, he wants us to help him build an ultimate PC to run Linux. He <laughs> says uh, he's lost touch with hardware, so he kind of needs a little help here. And again, this would be one people can chime into if they want as well in the feedback thread. He says he's an avid Linux user, and he's slowly mapping out his next ultimate PC purchase, and he wanted to know. What he should do. He's gonna, now he's going to have five PCI 8X slots, mm -hmm. and he's got, he's got uh, 16X connectors for all of them. Uh, and he'd like to set up a multi-monitor setup with as many monitors as possible. Wow. He's talking like maybe six monitors. And yeah. he's wondering, from what I've read, there's a lot of various tweaks to get Linux to use all six monitors at a high resolution. He says for, for him, he wants a lot of monitors because he likes to maximize his applications and Windows and a lot, run a lot of virtual machines with dedicated full-screen monitors. I'm really in over my head here, he says, and I'd really appreciate any all-help suggestions you may have. I really want to stick to NVIDIA because yeah. their dedication to the Linux community. Having said that, what little I can glean from Google, it appears people are having success with ATI's Ifinity line of cards. But please don't make me go to the dark side. You know, I actually was going to suggest Ifinity, so maybe right. I won't do that. Uh, I have never really gone beyond three monitors on a Linux system. And I've never gone beyond two. And as far as going to, you know, going to the dark side and going to ATI, while it works now, uh, I found that ATI is hit and miss depending on each release of their driver. Yeah, I don't you know. They I, just I, did a, I, they just did yeah. another big driver update. They seem to be doubling down on Linux support, right? I mean, yeah. there's this new they, driver they seem is to be, to but I'm still a little, I'm a little concerned. Although Nvidia certainly screwed the pooch a few times themselves, so it's not like it's not one's necessarily yeah. better than the other. I would literally go into here, here's what I would do. Whatever card, whatever setup you end up with, if you do get it working and you're able to use XRandar to get the setup. 
ghost that drive or clone that drive. Get, get a copy of it. That way, when you go to do something later and it just completely borks it, yeah. no big deal. Yeah. You know? you, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's the one thing I would do no matter what because you never know. You may have it working and then, pfft, you know, right out the window. There you have it. All right, next yes. email comes from Glenn, and this is just to let us know about Opus and Og. Now, I'm just reading this email because we get one of these a week, so I just thought right. we'd talk about it on the show and then see where it goes. Uh, so we've recently been talking about lower bit rates in the shows, and I actually have lowered the bit rates a little bit um, just to make it easier for folks to download. He said, I heard about this uh, codec via the Mintcast, which is on the Jupiter uh, radio uh, when they're able to broadcast. We've been having problems lately. It's called Opus, mm-hmm. and uh, it's uh, licensed under the BSD license. Now, you can tie Opus with Aug in the Aug container, and supposedly Opus is supposed to have some of the best fidelity at the lowest bit rates with any codec. You'll include a few links for us to check us out, but it's a free and open-source audio codec that might become the new standard. Now, Opus does look really promising. Sure. The main issue is is I wouldn't even distribute MP3 if it wasn't for the fact that 98% of all of the devices out there play it. Exactly. And they don't play Aug, right? I would only do Aug Vorbis if I could. Uh, That's but, the problem. Is entirely too many portable players do not support yeah. Aug, yeah. and they don't just, support yeah. Opus yet. However, there's new web standards out there that Mozilla is actively pushing that use Opus for the, for the audio portion mm-hmm. of that standard. And uh, if that takes off, even though Microsoft just recently introduced a competing standard which uses a different codec, but if 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 Mozilla stuff takes off, then we'll probably see Opus adoption go up. Huh. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, now here's an email, Matt. This guy uh, wants to know if we would recommend rolling the dice. It comes from Peer. Okay. And he says, I was just wondering about the current state of ButterFS. Should I stay away from it, or is it worth considering when installing a new system? Does it automatically detect SSDs and make the appropriate settings? I'm a longtime Linux desktop user, not a server guy. Has ButterFS anything to offer the average desktop user, or does Extended 4 cover all my bases? Well, I've not had a ton of experience with it. I mean, I don't even know if it's a journaling file system. I assume that it is. Um, And if it is a journaling file system, I guess with any new file system type experience, dedicated home and something sane like uh, EXT4 or whatever, and then maybe uh, ButterFS for the system, knowing that you may in fact work the system. You know, it's so funny. That would be the better way to do it. I did the, I don't know why I did this. I did the opposite. (laughs) I, made my, do the I don't know why I did that either. I made my home directory, my home yeah. partition is ButterFS on my Bonobo. And right, my system right. partition is Extended 4. But now that I think about it, the system That's... partition is expendable. I don't know why I did that. Um, well, it's, you know, I'm also looking at where the calls are being placed, you know, where the most of the activity is taking place. Yeah. And it's with system. I figured that's where you're going to see most of the benefit. Uh, again, I'm totally reaching here. but um, My understanding with the SSD question is uh, if you go mm-hmm. ButterFS, it does have um, better, uh, better provisions for SSD. I think right. some of those are turned on automatically. I don't think all of them are, like trim support, for example. I'm not sure on that. Mm-hmm. I have just a stock 1210 installation with ButterFS, and I haven't. I haven't really tweaked it at all. I haven't, right. you know, I actually wasn't even sure if I was running ButterFS. It's been a little while since I installed it, so I actually checked right before we did the segment. I haven't noticed any difference. I would say there's no compelling need driving switching from Extended 4 yet. Right. Not all the tools are there for ButterFS. It's not fully mature yet, but it's getting really close to that point, so I went ahead and started playing with it because I want to play with it. If this was a really important, like, I couldn't lose anything on this partition, I wouldn't have done that. And now... Now that I do kind of have some important stuff on here, I am kind of regretting it a little bit. Right, exactly. That was my only concern. It's just I wasn't sure I'd want to put my trust. Now, that yeah. being said, if you I have, have problems, a, uh, but you know, if, you, if you're running, a, I don't know, a, some sort of a backup setup for your home directory, you know, that's separate from that, maybe you have it backing up to a, a NAS or whatever, mm-hmm. then it's not as big a deal. Yeah. Um, you know, that, yeah. that's okay. As yeah. long as you've got a good backup scheme, eh, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. But, I uh, I just you know I I want to I want to play with it probably like uh, like uh, like Pear does so yeah. uh, if you you know put it like Matt's is or put it on slash var or something there you go there right? you go play yeah, with that, it, play with work. it somewhere safe and you know back it up yeah uh, all right so uh, one last question and then a little community uh, PSA all right uh, we have uh, one s- sent in here from Shape Shift Me on the subreddit and I would love to get people's take on this. Okay. Because I have my solution that I'm using, but I'd love to know what other people do. I figure people in our audience probably have an answer to this. I'm Since sure. I live in South Africa and our bandwidth sucks. Now, I love watching Last Tech Snap and a few others. I would sh- probably assume he means Coder Radio, Unfilter, Cybite, mm-hmm. and Fosho. Uh, the problem comes that I have four devices a Samsung Galaxy S3, a Tab 2, and a Nexus 7. Plus, he has an, a laptop running Android and Kubuntu 12.10. Wow. 
this guy's awesome. Yeah, I uh, like it. <laughs> he says, uh, now what I would like to do is download the files automatically and then sync, the podcast files, sync via Wi-Fi to my other devices so I can play later on. The need to sync to the laptop is not that important, as I don't often watch on the laptop. My tablets, however, get picked up as I need them on the go. Features that would be nice would be auto-downloading of new shows, resume playback from any device, auto-sync downloaded shows, etc. Now, is there something that can do this out of the box, or would I have to download the video file? Then sync it to the directories and play it in a normal video player. Uh, right off the top of my head, I'm th- and I just may not do everything he wants, but uh, one thing off the top of my head would be uh, Dropbox in a one dedicated machine that just stays on all the time, handling it. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? and then that you won't handle space. the marked play to resuming amongst devices. Yeah, yeah, that's that's where I'm. That's where I'm not sure. I mean, Gpotter, of course, is one option. You know, one option for the downloading process. But then, as far as the syncing it from machine to machine, uh, you know, a Dropbox like experience. The resume, though, from machine to machine, that's, that I'm not sure. That's tough. Yeah. You know what I do, mm. and I don't. I can't get the. I don't have the resume working from machine to machine either. Right. But uh, since we did that segment on Subsonic, I'm using that to do my podcasts on my server. It downloads them all to a directory that is accessible to all my devices, and then mm-hmm. I just I just commit. All right, I'm watching or listening to this show on this device, and I I only download them once, right. and I grab them when I need them. Now there are a bunch of really good Subsonic apps. I have not fully explored the podcasting capabilities of these Subsonic apps. If you could get an app that talks to your subsonic server and does the podcasting features, the ones I've seen only do the music library functions, but if you had one that did the podcasting functions, that would be ideal because then the subsonic server is managing the played state, the downloaded state, all of that. I wonder if as someone in the chat room actually brought this up. And we kind of thought of it at the same time. Is uh, XBMC? We obviously know that for you know desktops and stuff that would it certainly has great resume options. And I wonder if that would resume across different devices as they begin to mature on uh, Android and some of the other environments. You can go that, crazy. The chat room saying you could go crazy and you could throw Subsonic on like a GoDaddy shared hosting server and have uh, it download there, there. So then that would know. work. Yeah. That well, that is a solution. You know, I mean, and clearly he's got into devices that uh, he might be willing to do that. I like Subsonic just because I, uh, I never know which machine I'm going to be listening or watching a podcast on, mm-hmm. and so and all of them can access my server on my home LAN, and it also has support if you do port forwarding to actually be able to download and watch and stream stuff from your Subsonic, Subsonic server on the go. I just don't know about the podcast functionality in the apps, but it, right. But Subsonic itself will, you know, I have a download podcast all day long. Well, it's just yeah, it's 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 one of those things to where I think that's probably where he's going to end up having to go. Anyways, that is an yeah. open discussion thread on the subreddit. Mm-hmm. So if you guys have a solution for this, put it in there. I'll cover it on a future show because I would like to do that, and I bet a lot of people in the audience would like to be able to do that. So if you know of a way, uh, go to that link in the feedback section of our show notes and leave your thoughts in that thread if you would. Yeah, definitely. All right, one last little PSA. Uh, we just had a user join the uh, subreddit and ask if uh, there was any uh, last fans in the Midwestern United States, Minnesota to be specific. He would uh, love to meet up with folks and maybe go out and have a drink, talk Linux, and hang out and do uh, Linuxy type uh, discussions. And uh, if you would like to coordinate with him, there's people chatting about it in the subreddit. If you're in the Midwest and want to hang out with like-minded Linux users to watch the show, maybe toss in that thread and uh, say hi. Good idea. All right, Matt. Well, that wraps up just about everything I had for the show. Where can people find you throughout the week? What are you up to? Uh, as always, you can find me at matthartley.com. And for my most recent stuff, uh, datamation.com. Scroll down to open source and just go ahead and click that. Absolutely, sir. You always got great articles over at Datamation. You're just an article machine, aren't you? I'm always coming up with something. You writers. <laughs> you writers. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to give uh, a plug for a really, really, really compelling episode of TechSnap that we did this week. Episode 93 Red October hunts you. Uh, Alan did a deep dive into this malware called Red October, which has modules built by the Chinese and Russian governments, wow. it seems. It's wow. been around since 2007. It is this amazing cyber espionage spyware software that spreads between mobile devices and Windows desktops. My jaw was on the table during this episode it is so fascinating if you guys want to hear something really compelling and a great reason why you should be running linux in business and critical infrastructure uh go watch uh, red october hunts you episode 93 of tech snap very very fascinating stuff scary very, scary yeah. scary incredible it makes stuxnet look like child's play child's play i tell you man <sighs> now of course uh <laughs> Like we always like to mention, at the end of the show, uh, the Linux Action Show is live on Sundays at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. And if you're in the chat room, you can do things like ask me to do a Sean Connery impression. Matt. <laughs> I love well, it. 
Welcome to the Rock. That's all oh I got. That's goodness. all I got. Then you yeah. got to clock a guy in the back of a truck. Yeah, the Linux Action Show. This is the Linux <laughs> That's Action. Pretty good. That's pretty this good. This week on the Linux Action Show. Sean Connery is special guest host. No, see, that's horrible. That's horrible, Matt. Don't let me that's, do that. It's, uh, that's not too bad. <laughs> better than what I'd come up with. <laughs> well, you see, that's why you show up live, because then you get to ask me to do stupid crap like that and dance like a monkey for you. <laughs> exactly, uh, and we'll do it. Yeah, we do, don't we? <laughs> I'm telling you. Especially in between the segments. So. Oh, we're, we're, yeah, it's just absolute anarchy. It's great. you got to check it out. And uh, one last call out uh, for uh, an indie game. Uh, but especially Kickstarter projects that uh, are aiming or are very soon will be shipping for Linux or maybe something that just came out for Linux. Shoot those into our subreddit or Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com or hit our contact link. Next episode, I think we want to get a little gaming on. Uh, and if we get enough submissions, we'll do a, we'll do a segment on uh, some Kickstarter projects, indie games, casual gamings, games and things like that. So uh, Definitely. We're looking for a whole bunch of those, so send your favorite ones in and uh, we'll give them a look right here on The Big Show. Woohoo! All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Big show, big show, big show, big show, big show. Time for the email. Big show, big show, big show, big show, big show, big show. Check your tabs, man. Check your Check tabs. Your tabs. Knock it off. Check your tabs. You knock it off. <laughs> Don't email. Don't email. Don't email. Email. Email.